Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider. I'm Richard Emery. I've been hosting this show for a couple of years now. Uh, we try to talk about condo or association living and, and all the things that are uh, happening and uh, try to educate board members and owners and, and answer questions. We've done shows uh, based on responses from our audience, for example. And uh, we just did one recently on uh, delinquencies because of that uh, inquiry from uh, one of you out there in Hawaii land. But anyway, uh, we've been doing these formats. We've been interviewing guests at times. At okay, times, I've done a show where I talk about a particular topic in more technical terms. Um, so today we're gonna do that. We're gonna talk about the infamous or famous reserve study thinking. You know, we all know that um, condo associations have to, by law, do a reserve study. A lot of homeowner associations and co-ops do one because it kind of makes good business sense to prepare, to prepare for the future with regard to your future capital needs. But uh, technically speaking, uh, by condo law, so we're gonna kind of focus on condos today and the current thinking of reserve studies because uh, a little bit of history. In 1995, the Hawaii legislature passed the what we call the reserve law, uh, basically requiring all associations to be 50% funded by January 1, 2000. Kind of gave them a five-year window to uh, get figured out and fund the reserves. The law was amended in 1997 before the January 1, 2000 start date because in the real world out there and the, and on the, I hate to call it the mainland, but uh, the real world of reserve studies is uh, there are two funding methods. There's percent funded and cash flow funding, which we've talked about before. And the law didn't provide for the cash flow method of funding in, in 1995. And in 1997, it was amended to allow for the cash flow amending of funding because of the fact uh, that's the most dominant method of doing reserve studies uh, throughout the United States. Then on January 1, 2000, uh, the law took effect. And what I have seen, and I'm gonna go through this a little more detail later on, is that this is the future of lawsuits for condos. They've already started to happen. There's been many lawsuits already with regard to reserve studies. And it's fairly simple to insulate yourself from uh, lawsuits if you do just a few simple things. But we're gonna take you through kind of the reserve study uh, the first part of the show, we'll kind of review the history and kind of what we have. In the second part of the show, we'll talk about the modern thinking because there's so many ways to look at this, you know, um, that, that over the years, since 2000 to 20 years later, it has morphed with all these different issues and opportunities and ways to address funding issues. So uh, hopefully your association saves for the capital expense, but also um, doesn't break the bank of the homeowners that the plan has got some reasonable basis to it. Um, I'm often like to quote Mark Twain, who actually, uh, he popularized the saying of Benjamin Disraeli, but uh, I, what he said was, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. So you take data from a reserve study, and depending on how you put it in the in the sausage grinder and how you turn the grinder, what comes out can be vastly different by the ways and assumptions and things you do. But I'm gonna to try to add some clarity to this and give you some food for thought on modern reserve study thinking. And so let's just talk about a few of the very basic things before we begin. Number one, if you're a condo, you don't have a choice. The law says you will do a reserve study. And when do you do it? You have to do it every single year. Now that doesn't mean you hire a professional and you pay money to have a reserve study done every year, but think of it this way. You do a reserve study this year and you projected the painting to be done next year for $100,000. Well, next year comes and the board says, well, you know, I don't think we need to paint the building this year. I think we can get a couple more years out of it. Let's paint the building in 2025. Well, the reserve studies should be adjusted to forecast as new assumption. So every year you're kind of updating the reserve study and saying, well, A, 
Did we do what we said we're going to do last year? Yes or no? If not, recycle when you are going to do it. B, if you did do it, were the costs you had in the study accurate? Or, or what is the current accurate cost? So you'd be plugging in the new numbers based on new actual uh, local current information. And then number three, you might say, well, you know, there's something we never thought about that we want to do and, and, and that we should have included in the new reserve study. So you may add a component. So uh, conceptually speaking, you have to amend your reserve study every year. You may hire a professional to do the initial uh, base document, but you technically have to do the reserve study every single year as a part of your annual budgeting process. And I have some notes here, so I don't want to forget anything. But let me just give you the national definition of a reserve study. Quote, it is a budgeting tool, unquote. So what does that mean? It means it's not science. You know, I have to predict as a reserve specialist, useful lives, remaining lives, replacement costs, inflation, interest earnings on your money. And if I could do all that like science and accurately, they probably would have made me the head of the federal reserve system. But you can't do it as a tool, kind of take these assumptions and use them reasonably and forecast what your future capital needs are going to be. And what it also is not, it's not a quality inspection of the project. You're not going out there as a reserve specialist or if you're doing the reserve study yourself as a, uh, as a, as a board, which you can do, you don't have to hire someone. The law only requires you to do, uh, do it in good faith. So the issue becomes, um, it's not a quality controlled inspection. So uh, you don't know, you, you can look at all these tables and manuals we use, but you don't know if that's gonna be the actual circumstance, whether that front door will last as long as the manual say it'll last or because of use it lasts less or longer. So uh, you have to put it in perspective that this is a budgeting tool designed to make sure that you save money to pay for these components when they come due in the future. And what you need to understand, this all came about because there were lots of lawsuits and complaints back to the uh, Real Estate Commission, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Back in, uh, in, uh, in the 80s, uh, people would buy in a unit and all of a sudden get a special assessment for the roof. Well, they wanted to make it that if you bought into a brand new property and the roof has a useful life of 20 years and you lived there for 10 years, you made your pro rata share contribution during the time you lived there for your use of that roof or depreciation in some senses. So the idea behind the law was to force condo associations to look at all these capital components and then start a savings plan to give you the best chance that you have the money when that component needs to be repaired or replaced. And that's kind of a concept behind it with regard to uh, uh, how this works. So putting that into perspective, you have to do a reserve study. Now, if you hire a professional, there are three levels of reserve studies. For, it's called level one, two, and three. That's, that's, that's pretty simple. Level one is the highest level of reserve study. That's when you usually hire a professional. And what he does is number one, he comes out and takes your existing data and, and develops his own data, what all the components are. And then he applies useful life to it, saying it's got a 10 year life, 20 year life. If you're an existing building, what is the remaining life? Well, it's a 10 year life, but they've had it for five years. So it's only got a five year remaining life. And then they got to do a replacement cost. Under a level one, the reserve specialist doing the work actually goes and does a physical site inspection, helps develop the components along with your board and our resident manager, and talks to vendors and air conditioning people and painters and roofers to get what they expect the estimated budget cost is to replace those items. So it's the highest levels there's been the most work done with respect to developing the data. Is that perfect? Of course not. I mean, you can say the roof's gonna last 20 years and we have a lot of hurricanes and wind and rain and it'll last 15 years or 18 years or there's no wind and rains in the last 25 years. So it's why it's important to update it every single year. 
A level two study is the same thing as a level one, except we're not contacting the vendors and, uh, and, and we're using our own database. So we're not doing any independent verification of the costs. We are coming out to the property and looking at it again to see if we see anything. And we are taking the data uh, to develop the components and, and, and the information you need to calculate the research study. A level three, which is the lowest level, is we're just taking the data and regurgitating it. That is, it's the end of the year. Did we fix that last year? Did we replace it? How much did it cost us? We're not doing a site inspection and we're not doing um, independent cost verification. Now, what are the differences between level one, two, and three? The price. You know, it can be rather expensive depending on the size of the building to do a level one reserve study if you want to do it accurately. A level two is going to be significantly less because the most complex part of it and time consuming part is verification of cost information. And then a level three, you're basically taking the basic data and, and updating it for the next year's budget. And that's going to be the least expensive of all of them. And, and, and that's just how level one, twos and threes work. And I'm always asked how often should you do a level one? And I've never seen it writing anywhere, but everybody seems to say, well, every five years you should do a level one. Eh, I don't know if that's true or not, but, but uh, certainly having a level one to start the process would be very telling to a board of directors on, uh, on what they should include or, or not include in that. So what is in the reserve study? Well, you have very basically a few things, common elements. You want many limited common elements are not included, although sometimes if you have an open parking lot with asphalt, that might be included. In it. There's nothing to prohibit it from being included. You know, you can have um, uh, lanai is often uh, railings on the eyes, maybe a limited common element, but they have to be replaced at some point in time as the building ages. So you might include that. Number two is going to be if you own a resident manager's apartment or one exists because it's in your declaration, all the upkeep of that resident manager apartment, the appliances, the carpet, the painting have to be in the reserve study. Then there's going to be what we call fixtures. Well, the fixtures are going to be your ceiling fans in the community room, uh, the doorknobs, the lights on the wall, those types of things. Then there's personal property. If you're a big association, you may have pools, chairs, and furniture. You may have, um, uh, 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 what am I thinking of? Uh, equipment in the gymnasium, and, and if you have a fitness center or any other type of, uh, of personal property that you have that the residents enjoy while they live there. And then lastly, but not least, is some people include loans or um, uh, in, their, in, in their reserve study in the sense that um, that's kind of the components. So that's what you got to put in the study. And as I said earlier, you've got to estimate, define the components, estimate their useful life, estimate their remaining life, estimate their replacement costs, and then factor in by infl inflation and, uh, and uh, interest earning on your money. And I'm not making that up. That's in the law and the administrative rules that support the law. So it, it can be quite a complex project for a bigger association. So it's something you gotta pay attention to. And on that note, I've kind of given you the background. We're gonna take a short one minute break. Then we're gonna come back and talk about the modern thinking and about lawsuits and what's happened in the real world. We'll be right back in one minute.
Okay, wake up, I'm back. Anyway, uh, I talked about the kind of the background and history of reserve studies. I did want to mention that there's certain things you typically don't put in reserve study, and that is contingency, for example. You don't want to put another item in as a, like, uh, I don't know what it is, you know, I'm just going to throw in an extra amount of money because it demand, puts a demand on the contribution amounts and uh, is not normally included as well as your insurance deductibles or if you're going to do a future improvement uh, and put something brand new at the project that wasn't a part of the declaration, normally that stuff's not included. If I could give a test and say to somebody, I'll bet you $10 you don't know the two types of reserve studies. I would have made a fortune by now because nobody ever gets it right. They always say percent funded and cash flow funding are the two types of reserve studies. That's not the right answer. Those are the two types of funding methods, but it's not the right answer are the two types of studies. The two types of studies are the component method and the pooling method. And the component method does its funding as percent funded, and the pooling method does it as cash flow. And it's very, very different what um, the results can be. And I'm going to try to give you a, a visual example of this and keep it simple. Pretend you only have two components. A paint job you got to do in three years for $30,000. And a roof job you got to do in 10 years for $70,000. In my example, you can see you need 30,000 for the paint job and 70,000 for the roof in the next 10 years or $100,000. So let's look at component versus pooling method calculations. First, let's do the component method, percent funded method. What the rules are for a reserve study preparer is you must calculate each component separately. So back to the 30,000 for the paint job, I need one third of that, that's 10,000. And my roof job of 70,000 in 10 years, I need one tenth of that or 7,000. So I need $17,000 under the component method. And to be 100% funded, I need to collect 17,000. So what happens if I'm 50% funded? We well, collect $8,500. So in three years, when the $30,000 paint job is due, you have 25,500 in the bank and nothing for the roof. And what the administrative rules say is you must immediately assess the owner's $4,500. And then you must assess the missing amount of money or the 50% of the missing amount of money for the um, roof. And that was 7,000 a year. So 50% uh, 50 would be 3,500 a year. So you'd assess the owner's 10,500 to catch up on the 50% funding for the painting. And you'd have to assess the $4,500 for the, for the uh, have the money to do the painting. Well, I've said to people many times, hardly anybody in the United States uses component method percent funding, funding, funding. It's a single year number. People who project these percentages every year for the evermore are just doing it for their own exercise of futility. Because under component method, it's a single year study, what's your percent funded? And you have to calculate each component separately. Now, how does that compare with the pooling method? Remember I said 30,000 for the paint in three years, 70,000 for the roof in 10 years. I need $100,000 in 10 years. So if I collect 10,000 a year, I use 100% of it for the paint job, and I use 100% for the roof job for the subsequent seven years, I'm funded fully. I mean, I've got all the money I need, and I've done everything. And under cash flow, I only need $10,000 for the reserve study. Now, that being said, everybody uses the pooling method. Because if you look at all the studies I've seen, I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of studies, cash flow gets very erratic results and it's not worth the energy. And think of it this way, from evaluating your building, are you better off saying I'm 50% I'm funded or are you better off saying I'm funded fully? You know, your, your reserve study gives it the full amount of money you need. So that's kind of the difference between the two. But I would just tell you most reserve study preparers today, because we have very sophisticated software, will do the cash flow pooling method. And they'll give you the percentages, but I always delete them. I can do that by uh, clicking a little box on my software, say, don't show this. 
the creed confuses the heck out of people. You know, it doesn't make any sense to do that. So you need to know that the component method is not used anymore. The pooling method, cash flow, is the is the basic um, standard of the industry today. Now let's talk about what we've seen in litigation on this. Remember, you have an obligation to fund this fully. Litigation has come about from three or four events by associations. The first event is they didn't do a reserve study and the statute says you have to do a reserve study and an owner could file a lawsuit against you saying you didn't do a reserve study, force you to comply with it and be reimbursed for their cost to sue you because you had a statutory obligation that's in the law. In fact, if it was a breach of fiduciary duty, the judge or an arbitrator can make the board of directors personally pay for the costs to do reserve study because you have a statutory obligation to do it. So the number one reserve, uh, the number one uh, lawsuit is someone not having done an ad adequate reserve study. And, and, and through that process, typically they're not maintaining the common elements and the, and the owners are upset. The second common lawsuit is, and I had this happen uh, when I was an expert and a witness, I do a lot of expert witness work on reserves, is that the board said, you know, our reserves are in great shape. If we just pretended the central air conditioning system didn't exist. Oh, we're just gonna pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah, can we take out that $3 million component to replace in 20 years? We have more than enough money based on our contributions and we'll just figure that out 20 years from now. And so the lawsuits we're seeing is where reserve studies, either intentionally or I'm gonna say, it should have been obvious, left out major components to intentionally and willfully <coughs> try to reduce the reserve study contributions. And so the law is very clear, you can't do that. It's a violation of the statute to manipulate the reserve studies to get around funding your reserves properly. But the number two case I see is the ones that in, it, it, it's intentional because I go to meetings all the time and boards say, what if we just did it this way and took this out of the, out of the study? And I say, you can't do that. You know, I know there's a, there was recently uh, um, uh, a uh, board overthrow of our Wakey Key project. And uh, after the new board took over, they said, well, our business judgment is to take $9 million in expenses out of the reserves. Now, I've got this anecdotally, so I'm not involved in this, but uh, the lawyer was talking to me about it over a nice glass of red wine. And we were saying, are they nuts? I mean, it's, it's obviously fraud, it's willful intent. They're not gonna be covered by the director and officer liability insurance. So you can't, try to manipulate the data to say, well, I, I, I don't have a central air conditioning system in my example, you know. So the next one I find really interesting, mostly on new developer projects. They come and they say, okay, well, we are gonna put the developer's public report out and we're gonna uh, put in an estimate of maintenance fees and the fee disbursements, they call it. Um, they say, well, what we're going to do is say that we're gonna use 10% of maintenance fees as the number because allegedly, not so not true, but allegedly, the FHA says that 10% reserve funding is adequate. The problem with that thinking is Hawaii law doesn't say you can use the FHA 10% underwriting requirement as a measurement standard for reserves. It's not within the law. And frankly, if you read the FHA, and of course you get into HUD, FHA, Fannie Mae, all these different ones have little quirks on this, but they're all about the same. When you get into that, that's not what it says. It says not less than 10%, but otherwise prescribed by a reserve study. So you can't argue that <coughs> you can just take 10% and use that number because it's not a legal number to use. And so we're seeing lawsuits uh, against developers and managing agents where the reserves are, are inadequate. And what happens is new buyers get in there 
And all of a sudden, the first one or two years after they bought, they get a 20 or 30, 40, in some cases, 50% increase in maintenance fees to properly fund the reserves. And these people who may have been under a reserved housing uh, under ACDA or something like that, can't afford it. And so what do you mean? You, you, you use the number that you can't validate or document. I mean, it's fairly easy in today's world to look at like-sized buildings and see what they're funding for reserves and the status. But I see uh, many lawsuits right now where they're starting to attack developers because they fact they use a number that's not provided for in the statute. And so that's where the lawsuits are coming. Let me see if I missed anything on my list here. Oh, the last one is that they'll put in a contribution of, let's say, 100,000 this year and 110,000 next year and 120,000 next year. And they do in this 20 year forecast. And I'm looking at one uh, I'm working on right now as a consultant where the current contributions are 750,000 a year in 2021. And they're four million in 2041. So they go up every year by three, five, 10%, some number. And so the question is, if you're supposed to be paying for your fair share while you live there, and you're really kicking the can down the road and putting it on to someone else down the road, these annual increases, you can't call it inflation because the software itself already considers inflation in the analysis. So if they put 3% in every year, it's not inflation because the software has already got if they plugged in 3% in the number. But I'm gonna summarize now and we're gonna let you go back to whatever you were doing. That the key word in all this, I tell all the people to avoid litigation is disclosure. Whatever you did, make sure that your reserve study has adequate disclosures, exactly what your assumptions were, why you made those assumptions and what you did. And then even if you're wrong, you're protected. So the magic word is always disclosure. And people need to put more time in their reserve study and make sure it represents what the building is, what they expect in the future, and then at the same time, disclose what they did and why. And that way they'll avoid litigation because anybody who buys in there, you told them what your assumptions were and allow the law allows you to be wrong. And on that note, thank you for watching Condo Insider. It's uh, complicated to sometimes do this uh, over uh, the internet, but I hope you learned something about it. And if you have questions, feel free to, through Think Tech Hawaii, uh, send me an email or write me a question. Aloha and have a good day.